Psalm 65 is where I'd like you to turn in your Bibles. If you're not there already, Psalm 65. And we'll read verses 1 through 4 for our our, uh, beginning of the message. Verse 4 is the text, Psalm 65, starting with verse number 1. The Bible says there, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. I want to focus on verse number four where it says, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest. On a day like today, when we are celebrating our church's 63rd anniversary, we can truly say that we are blessed. We are a blessed people. I have a preacher friend of mine who pastors up in the Green Bay area, and if you were to see him today and you were to ask him, Pastor, how are you? I can guarantee you his answer. He would say, I'm blessed. That's what he always says. And you know what? That's the truth of the matter is all of us could say that. We could answer every day, I'm blessed, and we are. As a church, we are greatly blessed. I do think that very often we take this church for granted. We don't realize what God has given us here. We don't realize that God has given us a very special place. We are not a large church, but God has been good to us with a good spirit and a a good Uh, willingness of the people to work and to labor and a friendliness and a fellowship and a closeness and a willingness to even sacrifice and love on one another. God has been so good to our church. And let me encourage you as just a kind of a side note, don't take this church for granted. Take it seriously and realize that, you know, in an instant, God could take it away. The book of Revelation records God's word to the church at Ephesus and God's warning to them that if they would not return and do the first works, that he would remove their candlestick from its place, which seems to be an indication that he would take their church out of existence. And God could very well do that to us. I saw recently a video of uh, somebody going through uh, a building that used to house the Akron Baptist Temple. Anybody here familiar with Akron Baptist Temple? Back in the 60s and 70s, that was a very important church in what we would call our group. Uh, And I believe, was it Billings was the pastor there? I think that's right, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And today, that church does not exist. And that church with, I don't know, 4,000 seat auditorium, something like that, is completely and totally abandoned. And now people who go through and just, they go through and mark it with graffiti is all that basically uh, happens there and the roof is caving in and listen, that's the building, but the sad part is the church congregation does not exist anymore. Those things do happen. So we ought to take our church uh, seriously and not take it for granted. We are a blessed people. Well, not just as a church, but individually we are blessed. And this passage that we looked at this morning tells us one of the reasons that we are blessed. And we're blessed because God has chosen us. And I want to share some thoughts with you from God's Word and this message here this morning. Just uh, four quick thoughts this morning, and we'll we'll get to the food, all right? But God's Word is the most important food we can have this morning. So let's get into that. Let's pray, and then we'll ask for God's blessing, and we'll preach the message. Lord, would you enable me, please, to preach your Word with power and authority? Lord, thank you. You have blessed us. And Lord, of all the people here, I I know that I'm not the only one, but... I can say probably as much, if not more, than anyone else here, Lord, that I have been blessed by this church. This church has made uh, all the difference in my life. And uh, Lord, you have used the ministry of this church, the people of the church, the resources of the church to change my life and to put me where I am today. And uh, Lord, I, I certainly am thankful for that. And I know that the glory does not go to the church, it goes to you. But Lord, I do want to just say thank you for Madison Baptist Church. Thank you for these individuals that you have placed in the membership that 
Lord, that are the reason that this church does exist because of what you did in their hearts. But also, Lord, I am blessed because you have chosen me. Along with these who are saved, you've chosen us. Thank you. Now, Lord, would you use your word to remind us of your goodness, to bring glory to yourself. But also, Lord, if there's somebody within the sound of my voice this morning that has yet to call on the name of the Lord and believe on him for their salvation, would you please, Lord, make this the day of their salvation? You alone can save. And so I'm coming to you asking you that you would save. I thank you for what you have done and will do. In Jesus' name, amen. We are blessed. Our verse again, at verse 4, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to put it in my own words for you or give you a summary of it. It says, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even thy holy temple. If I could summarize that in my own words, I would say this. When God chooses a person, he causes them to approach unto him with the purpose of that person dwelling in God's courts and being satisfied with his goodness. That's what really this verse is saying. And out of that verse and out of that summary, I find four important parts of that verse. The first one would be the choosing. Because it does say, blessed is the man whom thou choosest. So there are obviously some people that God chooses. So the question then becomes, who are the individuals that God has chosen? Who are the chosen ones? Well, look with me if you would, and keeping your place in Psalm 65, turn with me over to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll look at verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, as you're turning there, I'll read the first couple of verses. It says, I exhort, first, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now, verse 4 is our main verse that we want to look at who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. As we ask ourselves the question, who are the ones that God has chosen? And we seek to answer that question. We have to, first of all, come to grips with the fact that it is God's will that all would be saved. It is God's will for all to be saved. That's what verse 4 says. Who will have, in other words, it is his desire, it is his will, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 6 tells us that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. So we have to come to grips with the fact that God desires that all would be saved. Look with me, if you would, at 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. The end of verse 1 says, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And verse 2 then begins with these words, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. Now, it's important for us to recognize that because, listen, when it says that Jesus is the propitiation for sins, that is not a light thing. That is not the Lord Jesus doing something small for the whole world. That is Jesus Christ doing something very large for the whole world. When it says that he is the propitiation for our sins, what it is saying is that he is the source or the, I should say, the recipient of, of the wrath of God that we deserve for our sins. That as God poured out his wrath for sin, Jesus was the receiver of that. So when it says that he's the propitiation for my sins, that's a big deal. But it goes beyond that to say he's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. That is an even bigger deal. So when we ask ourselves the question, who are the ones that God has chosen? The first answer we would have to come to grips with is that it's his will that all would be saved. 
The second would be that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And then we ought to look at a very famous verse, John 3, 16, that many could quote. John 3 and verse 16. One of the first verses that many people memorize is John 3, 16. But I would encourage you to remember what the Word of God says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that, what's that next word? Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world, that includes all of humanity. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. First John 2 calls it, He became the propitiation for our sins, right? Uh, he gave himself a ransom for all, Paul said to Timothy in the first verses that we looked at. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the extent that whosoever believeth on him, that's anybody who will believe on him, will have everlasting life. So who are the ones that God has chosen? Friends, the answer to that is everyone. God has chosen all that they could be saved that is an important point. Now again, I realize that there are many teachers who teach something else that God chose a few and those few are going to be saved and the rest will be cast into hell because God chose that those would be uh, cast into hell. But friends, that is not true. God did not ordain some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. God made it available for all of us to be saved. And to the point where, again, remember, Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. That's not a light thing. That's not like me going and, you know, paying for your meal at Culver's. That's not what Jesus did by becoming the propitiation, by the way, for people who will never receive him. He's the propitiation for their sins. People who will spend an eternity in hell, Jesus is the propitiation for their sins. That is not a light thing, that is a big thing. And so we are blessed when God chooses us. And whom has God chosen? God has chosen all of the world. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. Now, look with me at Psalm 65, the next uh, verse or next point, I should say, the next important thing that we want to see in verse 4 is the word approach. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee. Again, when God chooses a person, he causes them to approach unto him. He draws them to himself is another way that we could say that. And the Bible tells us that all of us were far from God. If you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ today, you were not always that way. There is not a single person here who was born a Christian. I want to say that again because it's so important. There is not a single person here who was born a Christian. I was born into a family where, again, my dad, as you saw his picture up there, he was a pastor when I was born. I was literally in church nine months before I was born, okay? Don't remember it. Don't ask me what the sermon was, okay? But you understand what I'm saying. I was in my mother's womb, and I know that my parents, enough to know, my parents were in church every single time the doors were open, uh, in, unless they were absolutely on death's doorstep, figuratively speaking, okay? They were in church. And so I was there from the moment of conception. I was in church every single time hearing my dad preach. But there came a day where I had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because I was, before that, far from God. Paul put it this way in Colossians, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. You know what that tells us? That before we were saved, we were enemies of God. But blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and as it says in our text verse, and causes to approach unto thee. God has allowed us or caused us to approach unto him. And that is God's goodness to us. Look with me, if you would, at John chapter number 6. We've already determined that God's will is for all to be saved. God has chosen all in that sense. Now, I realize that not all will be saved. And so in another sense, there are those who are especially chosen because God knows that they will choose to be saved, that they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But in this sense that we're talking about, 
All are chosen in that God has made all to approach unto him. Look at John 6 and verse 44. Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves, No man can come to me, Jesus says, except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. In order for you and me to be taken from our state of being enemies with God and be brought before the Lord, we had to be drawn by the Father. We are blessed. That's you and that's me, which leads us to the same chapter, verse 65, John 6 and verse 65. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Do you see man's free will in that verse? They were drawn to Jesus. Jesus gave them God's word. In one sense, they were chosen and blessed. But they chose to walk away and follow him no more. And the Lord Jesus gave them every right to walk away. You see, the grace of God can be resisted. The grace of God is not irresistible. It is possible for you and me to be blessed by God, to have His grace given to us, and yet for us to reject it and turn away from it, as His disciples did, some of His disciples, in John chapter number 6. But you and I have been blessed. We have been made to approach unto Him. And then look with me, if you would, at 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. Here's the wonderful thing about it. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 9. As David is giving a final counsel to his son Solomon, who later built the temple, right? We read about that. But 1 Chronicles 28, look at verse 9. Here's what David says to Solomon. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. You see, if we seek him, he will be found of us. So he causes us to draw unto him or to, to draw nigh unto him, to approach unto him is the wording of Psalm 65. And then it is up to you and me to seek him then based on his drawing. He is always the initiator of it. But then we have a responsibility to respond to his initiation. And so we have been blessed because we've made, been made to approach unto him. And then, of course, our text also says, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. The purpose of that person being chosen by God and being made to approach unto him is that he could dwell in God's courts. In other words, to dwell in the presence of the Lord. And friends, you and I have been blessed by God. To be made to approach in Him, God has chosen us and He's drawn us to Him. And yes, we had a part to respond. We had to respond well to that. We had to call on His name. We had to believe on Him. But friends, that's not a work. We don't get any credit or glory for that. If I were drowning in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean today and, and along came a ship or the Coast Guard, if I was close to the the coast of the United States, and the Coast Guard came along, and I was drowning, and they saw me drowning, and they uh, uh, threw out a uh, life preserver to me and said, grab the life preserver. Do I get credit for grabbing the life preserver? No. Do I get up to climb up on the uh, bow of that Coast Guard ship and say, I save myself? No, they save me. And friends, even that is a weak illustration of the fact that it's not just that God has thrown us a life preserver. He jumped in and rescued us. We don't then get to get glory, but at the same time, if, I, if someone's trying to save me from drowning and I fight back and I resist their attempt to save me, which, by the way, I've been told drowning people sometimes will do. And if I do that, well, then my death is on my own hands, isn't it? 
because the lifeguard attempted to save me and did his best, God will not force anyone to be saved. And so as God has sought to rescue mankind, man does have the opportunity to resist, and man does often. But you and I have been made to approach unto God. Why? So that we could dwell in his courts, to dwell in his presence. And that dwelling in his courts is twofold. As a Christian, I get to walk with the Lord Jesus. I was meditating on that as I came in to church this morning. Matthew 28, uh, Jesus said to his disciples right before he ascended, he said, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And I was meditating on that this morning. What a wonderful, beautiful promise. Jesus is always with us. I'm thankful for that. And I'm able to dwell in his courts. Hebrews puts it this way, that I am able to come boldly before the throne of grace. Isn't that a blessing? But friends, I wasn't just given the opportunity to dwell in his courts as in I get to have the presence of God. That's the first and foremost. But also, I've been given a local church. 63 years now our church has been in existence. We've had a place to meet and people with whom to fellowship. And God has met with us. The Lord Jesus made this promise. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. As we gather together in Jesus' name, every time we gather, Jesus is here with us. We get to dwell in his courts. That is a blessing. We are blessed people. Look with me, if you would, at Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Again, when God chooses a person, he causes them to approach unto him with the purpose that that person dwelling in God's courts would be satisfied with his goodness. Psalm 84. Notice what the psalmist says here about God's courts, or in other words, his presence. Psalm 84, verse 1. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. That means pleasant, wonderful to be with and around. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Verse 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. That sounds a lot like our psalm that is our text, isn't it? They will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca, which means bitterness, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give, give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. You see, we are a blessed people. Why? Because we have been chosen by God, made to approach unto him, for the purpose that we would dwell in his courts. And dwelling in his courts is better than a thousand. Here's what that means. If we had to choose, if we could weigh them in a balance, one day in God's courts or a thousand days outside of God's courts, the day in God's courts would outweigh. It would be better than a thousand anywhere else. You and I many times fall prey to our society and we fall prey to the materialism that we see around us and maybe if you're like me, every once in a while you'll take a drive through a neighborhood like Maple Bluff. And you'll see those big houses on the lake and big fancy yards and all of that stuff. And every once in a while, maybe if you're like me, and maybe I'm just telling on myself here and you'll think less of your pastor, that's okay. But every once in a while there'll be a little tinge in my heart that'll say, boy, it'd be nice to have a place like that. But you know what the truth of the matter is? That's a lie. Now, if God gave it to me, that'd be a blessing. I wouldn't complain, all right? But God has not chosen to give that to me. He's given me the place that I have. And the truth of the matter is, he's given me much more than that because even if God took away the place that I have tomorrow and I had no place to call as a roof over my head, 
I would be able to dwell in the courts of the Lord. And a day in his courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. Now I can say that with my mouth. I don't often believe it in my heart, but it is the truth. And friends, it's not only true for me, it's true for you. And again, I said at the beginning of the message, oftentimes we take what we have here and our relationship with God, we take it for granted and we think to ourselves, oh, if only this or if only that and shame on us for not recognizing how blessed we are. We have been blessed. And that brings me to the fourth and final part of the verse. We've seen that God chooses a person. He causes them to approach unto him with a purpose of that person dwelling in God's courts. And then what's the end of that? It is satisfy, uh, satisfaction. That brings us back to our text, which is Psalm 65, 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. What is the end result of dwelling in God's courts? Satisfaction. Being with him is to be satisfied. We won't take the time to look at Psalm 16 because I quote it to you all the time. As a church member, you ought to know Psalm 1611, okay? Because I mention it all the time when it tells us there that in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That's our God. If you want real joy, dwell with him. That's where it is. It's not found in money. It's not found in fame. It's not found in a, a, a lack of having any health problems. It's not found in this thing or that thing. It is found in dwelling with God. Psalm 36 is a, is a psalm I would like you to look at. Psalm 36, verse 7. Psalm 36 and verse 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures, for with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. With thee is the fountain of life. You and I really want life. It's found in Christ, in knowing him. We are blessed because we have been chosen and made to approach unto him. And yes, we had some part in responding to his working, and I don't always understand the line of how much was human responsibility and how much was God's sovereignty. I leave that before the Lord, but I can tell you this. I'm thankful that he chose me. Thankful that he called me to approach unto him, and he did that with the purpose that I would dwell with him. And I was far from him. I was an enemy of his, as are you if you are without Christ. But he gave me salvation and called me near, and now he calls me his son so that I can dwell with him. And the end result of that is that I am satisfied with his goodness. And that will culminate in the ultimate satisfaction and we find that in Revelation 22. Let's look there as we close. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. This is at the end when God finishes all things and at the end even of the kingdom and there is a, a new heaven and a new earth and it's, uh, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. In chapter 22, verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. That's the culmination of all that we have read about there in Psalm 65, that there is coming a day when we will dwell with him, not just in his courts as in fellowshipping with him in the midst of a sinful world, but there is coming a time 
when it will culminate in a new kingdom, a new heaven, and a new earth. And he will be the light of that place, and we will be blessed by being able to be in him. And I want to remind you of this, friends, that we are a blessed people. We ought to give God praise. We ought to spend our days thanking him. Shame on us for complaining. Shame on us for thinking that God has not been very good to us. Above all people on the earth, we have been blessed. Let's spend some time today remembering that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to preach your word to your people this morning. I thank you for them. Thank you for bringing them here on this Sunday and, Lord, giving us a reason to celebrate 63 years of your blessing upon our church. Thank you for that. Now, Lord, I pray that your hand of blessing would be on uh, this time of invitation. Lord, if there's somebody, again, within the sound of my voice that has yet to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and have uh, their sins forgiven, then would you please grant them faith and repentance to believe the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would have your hand of blessing as well in the invitation for those who already are born again, that, Lord, we all would commit ourselves to giving you glory, honor, and praise for all that you have done. I thank you, Lord, that you will. In Jesus' name, amen.